RAF's legless anti-hero, Sir Douglas Bader by the Fat Electrician. We all love a good anti-hero story. We all absolutely love the video on Jake McNasty McNeese. And we have Fat Electrician gracing our feed with another anti-hero story. I'm ready. I hope you are, because this is going to be an absolute treat. You know somebody's an absolute gangster when they're not an American, and I'm still going to make a video about them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Today we're yeah. talking about Sir Douglas Bada, a World War II British RAF fighter pilot ace with at least 22... Bada. I totally mispronounced his name. I am so sorry. ...confirmed kills, and he managed to do all of that as a double amputee with no legs, which Legend. I think we can all agree is a pretty impressive feat. Yeah. Yeah or lack thereof. But first, we're <laughs> sponsored because this video is brought to you by Permasafe. All right, here's the deal. Permasafe is not the average set of rubber gloves that you've seen at the hospital before. These things are designed for people that work outside of a clinical setting with their hands that still don't want to touch something gross or something hazardous. Your paramedics, your law enforcement officers, construction workers, mechanics, farmers, anybody that's working a manual labor job where typical rubber gloves simply aren't going to hold up, you have Permasafe. These things have diamond oh, yeah. texture on the palms so that even if your hands get greasy, or wet, you still have traction and you're able to grab stuff. They're also twice as cool. thick and four times more puncture and tear resistant. Okay, check this out. Okay, look at this. That's like half a gallon of water inside this rubber glove right now. That's, that's marketing right there. Like, <laughs> I'm like, I've definitely watched other channels that are gonna like, you know, oh, they're gonna have like a side-by-side -side test or they're going to do just some weird like, oh, yeah, this this is the, the equation. This is how this works. What does fat electrician do? Just goes <laughs> over to the faucet, fills it up with water. Like, guys, look at this. That's the best marketing I've ever seen. That That's how you market. God, they, God, that is. That is perfect. Like, no, I'm being completely serious. Like, I'm not making this is this is perfect marketing. I love this right now. That's oh, quality jiggling right so there. So good. Okay, I'm pretty sure this is what the Hulk's jeans are made out of. God. Oh no, now my hands are all wet from filling up that other glove with a bunch of water. <laughs> Listen to all the traction and grip I still have with these goddamn gloves. And here's the best part about these. You don't have to go to a special website. You don't have to follow my link. You don't have to use my discount code. You can just go to Amazon. They are on Amazon Prime. Huh. You can order these and have them at your house tomorrow. And I know what you're thinking, but chubby electron guy, I don't need rubber gloves. Okay, <laughs> Listen to me. Rubber gloves are like jumper cables and condoms. You never need them until you need them. Just honestly, considering ugh, I, have to, I have to look up the gun oil that I use, but I looked at the back of it and it's like, yeah, this is pretty toxic and caustic. And I'm like, oh, so I should probably wear gloves with this. <laughs> Got it. Should probably actually. Oh, God. And then I, I made the mistake of using a not rubber pair of gloves like glove gloves. Uh, you know, the ones that you can just like Velcro on. Oh my God. I, I hate the smell of gun oil, especially when it gets into like clothing and shit. Oh, it's awful. But like, no, yeah, he, he's right. You, you don't need rubber gloves until you need them. As somebody that needs better gloves when I have to go clean out my AR platform. Trust me on this one. Go to Amazon, buy yourself a box of Permasafe gloves, keep them in your car, in your garage, and at some point in the future, you're going to be holding something absolutely disgusting yeah. in your hands. You're going to be like, wow. Fat electrician was right. This was definitely worth the money. So yeah, yeah get yourself some permasafe gloves because shit happens. <laughs> it just doesn't have to happen on your hands. Back to the video. Got All right, him. Douglas Bader, born in London in 1910. World War I was going on when he was a child. His father and his older brother-in-law both fought in World War I. His father was an engineer and his brother-in-law was a fighter pilot. Because of that, young Douglas knew that he wanted to be a fighter pilot too. So uh -huh. fast forward 1928, Bada's 18 years old. He just graduated from high school. He immediately joins the RAF as a cadet pilot as well as going to Cambridge for college and while doing that he would become a star athlete for both organizations while at Cambridge he would play hockey box and become a star rugby player apparently he was so good at rugby that it was believed that after college he would join the national team to represent his country and uh -huh. then for the RAF he would end up playing on their official cricket team I have no idea what cricket is and I really don't care to learn <laughs> nobody understands cricket you gotta know what a crumpet is to understand cricket I mean yeah I thought crumpet was the mountain that the Grinch lived on so obviously I have no idea what's going on fast <laughs> okay you know in, in in his defense i have no idea either i have no idea how cricket's played my closest like association with cricket is the cricket bat from left for dead <laughs> <laughs> Forty in two years, 1930, he's still going to college at Cambridge, but he graduates from a cadet to a full-fledged commissioned pilot in the RAF, at which point he becomes known as an absolute 
daredevil while also being extremely talented. He can pull off every aerial maneuver known to man at this point, including some that are so dangerous that they're banned. And not only does he do those maneuvers, he does them below 2,000 feet, which huh. is also against the rules because it's extremely dangerous. Yeah. But Vader doesn't care about rules. He doesn't care what you tell him. That's just guidelines. He's going to do what he wants. Because of that, he actually gets selected to represent his squadron at the Hendon Air Show in a flying competition, which he wins. Then later yeah. that year in 1931, he is preparing to go defend his title at the Hendon Air Show in early 1932, at which point he tries a dangerous maneuver too close to the ground, and the wing of his Bristol Bulldog Ooh. catches the ground, crashes the entire plane, Ow. crushing his legs. Because of this, both of his legs would have to get amputated, one above the knee and one just below the knee. Ooh. At this point, you have to remember it's the 1930s. He is told that he is never going to be able to walk again without crutches. And that's what they believed because nobody had ever done it before. But you also yeah. have to remember, Bada doesn't care what people tell him. The same attitude that got him into this mess by not listening to the rules is the same attitude that's going to get him out of this mess <laughs> by not listening to what the experts tell him he's going to be capable of doing. Yeah. Over the course of his rehabilitation, not only does he regain the ability to walk without crutches or a cane, something he was told was going to be impossible he also regains the ability to drive his sports car wow. golf and dance all on dual prosthetics and he may dude just bounced back like she like legit just bounced back like nah i'm in control <laughs> managed to do all of that in four months essentially by himself because all the experts thought it was impossible yeah. it wasn't like modern day where there's an expert that has a refined process on how to help somebody out in his situation no right. this man blazed the entire path on his own with no background in physical therapy wow. and just figured it out so fast yeah. forward june 1932 five months after losing both of his legs he shows back up to the raf like hey guys made a full recovery let's get me up in one of those planes so i can take it for a spin at which point they tell him absolutely not you don't have your legs we're not going to let you fly he then argues with the raf to which they agree that they're going to let him have a test flight with another pilot and if he does good everything should be fine so that's exactly uh -huh. what they do he takes a plane up he does a bunch of maneuvers he lands the plane all with the use of his prosthetic legs no problem whatsoever because he is a phenomenal pilot right. he then gets cleared by a medical board saying that he is fit for active duty and he is reinstated as a pilot wow. fast forward one year later april 1933 the raf for seemingly no reason decided that they were going to reverse that decision and ground him because there was nothing in the king's regulations in regards to a legless pilot to which what so that's not gonna be a controversial decision what Bada's like, yeah, no shit. I'm the first guy that's ever done it ever. That's why you guys put me through all that testing and a med board to see if I could do it. And I've been yeah. doing it for the last year. Why would you ground me now? To which the RAF was like, don't really care. That's what we decided. Fuck you. Get out of the plane. Bada is informed that he has to pick a new job where he stays on the ground. And Bada, being a man of his stature, isn't going to stand for that shit. No. So he retires early. From there, he spends the next couple of years collecting his military pension, working a desk job, golfing 36 holes a day. He also meets his wife and starts to settle down. Then uh -huh. over the course of 1937, 1938, Douglas would write the air ministry multiple times saying, hey, if the next world war is going to kick off, let me know. I'm happy to come back and fly a plane for you then fast forward sure enough september 1st 1939 germany invades poland world war ii kicks off and the uh -huh. raf finally decides to call back douglas bob <laughs> Yeah, it's so, so good. shows back up in an RAF base and he is pumped because last time he was flying planes was eight years ago and they were like old biplanes like his Bristol Bulldog. Now they got spitfires, they got hurricanes. Planes have come a long ways in eight years and he is absolutely thrilled to be able to get up and fly one. And absolutely. at this point, RAF leadership yet again informs Douglas, oh, we're not actually going to let you fly a plane. You don't have any legs. That would be preposterous. Oh my God. Oh my God, please. Please just let the man fly. Oh my god. It's not this hard. We thought you wanted to join the war effort and do a ground job just to help out. At which point, Douglas is furious. Yeah. I am a peacock! You gotta let me fly! 
Luckily, however, some of the people that Douglas had served with prior eight years ago were now higher ranking officers and they had some pull and they convinced the higher leadership to give this guy a shot because he's an incredible pilot. So uh -huh. the higher ups finally agree to give Douglas a shot, but that shot entails him going back through flight school all over again, which he does. And after his first 11 hours of flying with an instructor, he is finally allowed to take up a plane on his yeah. own. And the first thing he does is invert it and fly it upside down <laughs> at a low altitude right past all the instructors. <laughs> basically giving all of the instructors the middle finger. He then peels off and goes and does a bunch of other maneuvers. And you have to realize this is the first time he's been inside of the cockpit of a plane by himself in like a decade. Yeah. And last time he was flying a plane solo, it was his Bristol Bulldog, which is a biplane. And now he's flying a Spitfire. This is a huge upgrade. And uh -huh. he's blown away at how incredible this plane handles. He's able to take turns and pull off maneuvers way tighter and way faster than he ever would have dreamed of being able to do inside of a biplane. And initially he gives all the credit to the new airplane and how advanced aircrafts have become. But uh -huh. then over the course of a little bit more training, he starts to realize not all the other pilots can pull off these turns and maneuvers as tight and as fast as he can inside of the Spitfire. They have the same plane. Is he just that much better than these guys or what? Is I feel like there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be a lot like really pissed off, right? Like their pride's going to get hurt. Like they're going to think they're hot shit. They're going to think that they are the best of the best. And this, this, and they're definitely going to use it in the uh, in a uh, derogatory console. Like this this double amputee is just smoking them in his plane. That's that's going to hurt some people's prides. And you know what? Good on him. Good on Sir Douglas Bada. Like, oh my god, what is going on? And then it dawns on him. Well, you ain't got no legs, Lieutenant Dane. Yes, I know that. He realizes that it's all because of G-Force, because when a pilot takes a turn or does a maneuver, they're exposed to G-Force, and if they do it too fast or too tight, they're exposed to too much G-Force, all the blood in their body rushes down to their legs, and oh. they lose consciousness. Yeah, you see where this is going? Doug doesn't have any legs for the blood to rush to. G-Force is just Viagra to this guy at this point. <laughs> Dude is literally the real-life version of Star Fox. Yeah, yeah, remember the Nintendo video game? You ever notice how Star Fox and everybody in his crew all have metal legs? According huh. to the internet lore, it's because they all had their legs amputated to resist G-Force more. In a huh. weird twist of fate, his disability has turned into a physical advantage inside the cockpit of a fighter plane. He quite wow. literally has a leg up on the competition. <laughs> and because of this, a lot of other fighter pilots and high-ranking officers in the RAF start to not like Bada because they claim that he's arrogant and difficult to work with because here he is getting told he's never going to walk again. Not only does he walk again, he learns how to golf, he learns how to drive a car, and now here he is out piloting most of yep. them. What an arrogant prick. Luckily, Doug doesn't really give a- He is quote-unquote difficult to work with. <laughs> oh my god. Oh... I've definitely had jobs where that's been speak. Oh my God. Shit, he's not here to make friends. He's here to win a war. And that's exactly what he sets about doing. His yeah. first combat mission is over the skies of Dunkirk during Operation Dynamo. If you don't know, this is the operation where they had to evacuate the entire British military from Dunkirk. Yes, this is what the movie Dunkirk is about. If you don't know, basically when Germany took over France using their new Blitzkrieg tactic, they took over France so fast that the British army couldn't even get a foothold inside no. of France to start fighting back. The entire military was caught and surrounded in the city of Dunkirk and they had to evacuate their entire army barely making it out with their lives. And Douglas Botta was in the skies over Dunkirk in a Spitfire running defense for these guys while they got evacuated. Yeah. During this time, Botta claimed to have shot down five German Messerschmitt BF 109s, but he is only officially credited with shooting down one and potentially damaging several others. Because every time Botta says that he shot down an enemy plane, it is extremely scrutinized because again, a lot of the other fighter pilots in leadership don't like him because they think he's an arrogant prick. So literally- uh, That's so- it's so bad. And that's why, like, I don't know. I, I feel like I'd have an issue with why I haven't gone to the military, right? I'd have an issue with the chain of command, especially the people like that, that they just don't like certain people, right? That's who I have issues with. <laughs> your, per your people like this who are actively outperforming your grunts on the ground that are using their, their charging handles as spoons or their MREs. Those are the kinds of people that I like. Every plane that Bada is officially credited with shooting down has been spotted by him, his wingmen, and an independent third party on the ground to uh -huh. verify that he shot that plane down before they would give him credit. For wow. It. But that's besides the point. Whether he shot down one enemy or five ultimately doesn't really matter because Douglas Bada and the rest of the RAF 
were able to hold off the German Air Force from bombing the men on the ground long enough for the entire British military to get evacuated so that they could live to fight another day. And because of this, Douglas was promoted to squadron leader and given command of Squadron 242, or at least what was left of it. You see, Squadron 242 was a bunch of Canadian hurricane pilots that had been stationed in France and had been fighting the Luftwaffe for a while, uh -huh. and they had sustained heavy losses and their morale was cripplingly low. Bada comes in as their new leader, turns the entire squadron around, <laughs> takes a squad... <laughs> Oh, the military isn't funny. The military doesn't have a sense of humor. Also, the military. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> no way. Oh, that's beautiful. Oh, I, I needed that. And turns them into an effective fighting force again, cutting through red tape and bureaucratic bullshit to get his men what they needed to be successful. And because of this, even more of his peers and the chain of command starts to like him less because he is sticking up for his subordinates. And to me, this is the most important part of the entire story because as this story continues to go on, you're going to notice that the more successful this man becomes, the more and more some people tend to not like him and try to trash his reputation. I have watched countless interviews of other people talking about their relationship with Douglas Botta when he was alive, and all of their opinions can be summed up into one of two. Opinion number one, he is a literal superhero. Yeah. Opinion number two, he was an arrogant prick, but even I can't deny he was a good fighter pilot. And oddly Why not both? <laughs> enough, all of the people that thought he was an arrogant prick were fighter pilots that were in an adjacent unit, uh -oh. or leaders that were in an adjacent unit, not his unit, because his chain of command absolutely loved him, and all of the men that served underneath him also absolutely loved him. To give ah, so it's almost like there's confirmation bias here, and that there's a reason for them to dislike him. Oh, interesting how that works. an idea of how highly his men thought of him, one of the pilots that served underneath him, Sir Alan Smith, later in life said in an interview about the time that Douglas Botta made him second in command for a mission, it felt like God had told me to come up and keep an eye on heaven for him. Which to me says everything, because I think how you're perceived by your subordinates is a far better metric of your character than how you are seen by the people competing against you for a promotion. I would argue that 100%, like... 100% would argue that I'm pretty sure people in the in the, the comments and chat could also quantify that, right? Like, it matters more what the people underneath you, what, what, even outside of a military setting, right? Like, say I was working at a restaurant, right? And I was managing a restaurant or I was a, a shift lead, some form of management, right? It speaks a lot more if the people under me recognize, yeah, the job can be shitty sometimes. Yeah, doing... Do, yeah. <laughs> sometimes things can be shitty. But also, how if they respect you, if they know that you're doing your best, and if they have a positive outlook of you, doesn't that speak more volumes of your character than the same job and hating a manager? I don't know, at least to me. Huh. I'm pretty sure you're wrong because I read on the internet one time that somebody's grandpa met him once during World War II, and that guy's grandpa told him that Douglas Botta wasn't very polite. Huh. Jesus Christ. Okay. And? Like, <laughs> I don't know. Like, I, I know it's a caricature, right? But it's also so true because I've seen this exact thing happen on like Twitter and stuff. It's so wild. I've even had some like wild comments at me that I'll just, I'll just end up deleting them. Like, they're just so like left field or like they're trying to start shit. I just delete them at that point. I have way better things to do. It's like, can you just imagine, right? Like, you know, yeah, no, I, I, uh, <laughs> I met some Marines at a Marine base and uh, I said that one of their boots was dirty and they got mad at me. Yeah, and? <laughs> Should I have critiqued that their boots weren't spotless? Probably not. <laughs> Could the Marine have been having a hangover? Could be. And? <laughs> not everyone's going to be polite all the time. <laughs> like, what? Hello? Okay, first of all, word of mouth four degrees removed is not a reputable source, so no. I don't really care. No, Second of that all, would count. even if that was true, let's put it into perspective. Your grandpa met the guy while he was in World War II. Yeah. Okay, so at this point in time, Douglas Bada is literally a legless man in the biggest ass kicking contest the <laughs> world has ever seen, and he's winning. Okay, the guy's yeah. probably got a lot on his plate. It wouldn't surprise me if he was a little stressed out and maybe angry sometimes. Okay, yeah. shit happens. Get over it. 
You know yeah. what? I'm sorry. I'm getting sidetracked. It just really, really annoys me when people that have never met somebody go out of their way to shit on their legacy for doing something incredible because it makes them feel better about themselves. I mean, so here's the difference, right? Because I feel that there's like room for like, oh, well, well, Kip, you yourself have you know said things and cited things about certain events, like because you know, sometimes I like to have stances on things, put it that way. Just a lot more effort than I'm willing to put in it, so I've kind of stopped for the most part. But like, right? Like, if <laughs> I'm not saying, well, through the through a retweet thread on Twitter, this person apparently did this, and that's why I'm not okay with what they're doing, right? Versus current situation regarding a large creator doxing another large creator, right? <laughs> Being nameless, right? Yeah. Uh. How many citations, first party citations, can I literally pull off of a quick Google search, YouTube search, and Twitter search? Especially with statements made from the parties involved themselves. See, that's different. It's different if you have a citable interaction and you can be like, yeah, no, here's my work cited page. Like if you're writing a paper, it's different if it's like, well, yeah, well, through word of mouth, you know, it, <laughs> that this one time my friend's dad that, that owned Nintendo, by the way, right? <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Come on, man. Like, it's okay to not like somebody. I get that. Like, it, sometimes you just run across people and you don't like them. I've run across people that I don't like. Less than you'd think, right? I, generally, I just kind of vibe. I'm kind of just here, right? <laughs> but it's so, it's so weird. People just kind of like, I guess, get in their own echo chambers or something. Or they have such this weird confirmation bias against certain people. It's so weird. And I, I totally, like, empathize with this frustration. Anyways, moving on. All right, fast forward July 1940. Douglas and Squadron 242 are going to partake in the defense of Great Britain during the Battle of Britain, which, if you don't know, is a period in time between July and October of 1940 where the Germans essentially tried to bomb Great Britain every single day. During Ugh. this time, Squadron 242 is credited with shooting down 62 enemies and only having four of their own shot down. Wow. Of those 62 enemies that were shot down, four of them were shot down by Douglas Bada. This Woo. would bring his career total to five, officially making him an ace fighter pilot. Because huh. of this, news outlets pick up the story and they begin to portray Douglas as the hero of the Battle of Great Britain, essentially using him for pure propaganda. Like, hey, check yeah. this out. Great Britain has a legless fighter ace and he is helping to win the war against the Nazis. We literally have a legless man yeah. beating you guys in an ass kicking contest. <laughs> What's up? So now Douglas is getting all this attention. He's being used for effective propaganda, which yeah. is great, but it also serves to drive the divide even further between him and the other fighter pilots that already didn't like him. Oh, absolutely. Because now they're jealous that he's getting a bunch of attention for doing just as well as a lot of them did. And if that wasn't bad enough, he's now also on the shit list of the really high ranking officers in the RAF because he had the audacity to back up his boss and friend, Lee Mallory. Basically the standard operating procedure no for the idea RAF about that during one. the defense of Britain was kind of like aerial guerrilla tactics. As soon as they identified an incoming bombing run, they would scramble a small group of RAF fighters that would go up and utilize hit and run tactics to shoot down the bombers. Lee Mallory, on the other hand, thought that they should respond with overwhelming force in a strategy that he referred to as the big wing. And this uh -huh. was essentially taking somewhere between three and five squadrons in one giant formation, like 50 to 70 fighter planes all at once and running right towards the bombing runs. Mm -hmm. And Douglas agreed that this was a good strategy and he was a huge proponent of it. Ultimately, throughout the Battle of Britain, the big wing was only used five times. Uh -huh. Of the five times that it was used, the men that flew in the formation said that it was incredibly effective and they shot down a bunch of enemies. Right. The men that did not fly in the formation said that it wasn't as effective as they're claiming it was and that they're lying. So that aspect is kind of an unknown. I, I would need to see statistics. I would, I would have to see... Well, I was going to say, I'd love to see reports. It depends if that's classified information. I mean, it, most most everything World War II has been declassified at this point, right? So I think that'd be public information. I'd have to see reports on it. But we do know for certain that planes flying in the big wing formation were safer because there's safety in numbers. That makes sense. They were less likely to get shot down. The downside of the big wing was that it took a lot of time to get that many planes up in the air and in formation. Well, right. So response time was lower. Yeah. So as far as which plane was better, aerial guerrilla warfare or the big wing, I'm not really sure. But one thing is for certain. You I think interjecting, I, I think it's dependent on the situation, right? It de it's do you need the hammer or do you need the chisel and i think depending on the situation both could have their uses but i will also cite that i'm a civilian and i don't have 
schooling on this on this matter using both of them multiple times had a beneficial effect because the first time the big wing was used all the german pilots were being told that great britain only had 10 15 20 aircraft left and they go out on this bombing run and here comes just 70 wiped. spitfires and hurricanes and just fucks up their whole day it had a devastating effect on enemy morale and on top of that now they don't know what the british tactics are they have to both anticipate being attacked with overwhelming numbers mm -hmm. and being attacked with a small, fast, responsive hit and run force, which means right. Well, so how do they plan for that? Right? Are they gonna go heavier? But if they go heavier, expecting the big wing, it could just be the small, the small one, right? If they go try to go stealthy, they they could just get big winged. It dependent on the situation it's very difficult for the germans to plan their attacks because now they had to plan for both overwhelming numbers and a fast responsive force yeah. so yeah in addition to his newfound fame people are also upset that he had the audacity to have an opinion of how to conduct aerial warfare even though he's an ace fighter pilot and presumably an expert in aerial warfare but yeah whatever regardless yeah you know it's just <laughs> god Sometimes I'm glad I'm not in the military because some of these military politics just seem really, really bad. Douglas ends up getting a promotion to wing commander and he is now in charge of three squadrons instead of one. So then from late 1940 to August of 1941, Douglas and his men take the fight to the Germans, flying hundreds of missions, shooting down a ton of Germans, Douglas himself shoots down an additional 17, bringing his career Yeesh. total to 22, six probables, and a bunch more shared. But on August 9th, 1941, Douglas Botta would fly his last mission ever when he would collide in midair with a German Messerschmitt BF-109. Somehow, Douglas survives the initial impact, but his plane is absolutely going down. Yeah. So he quickly opens the canopy and goes to climb out of the plane, but the impact has crushed one of his prosthetic legs Fuck. inside the cockpit, and he can't get out. So he's pulling on it, he's pulling on it, he's desperately trying to get out of this plane and time is running out he only has a few seconds left and he says fuck it it's worth a shot and he opens his parachute while still inside the plane his parachute huh. catches wind yeah. and rips him out of his prosthetic and out of the cockpit. Yeah. He then attempts to evade German capture, hopping around on a single prosthetic leg. He is eventually captured and becomes a prisoner of yeah. war. Okay, now to be fair, technically we don't know for sure that it was a mid-air collision that he was involved in because his plane was never recovered. And like I said, everything Douglas reports back is extremely scrutinized because leadership doesn't like him. And they Oh, absolutely, I would argue. The Germans may have destroyed that plane, considering the amount of uh, propaganda that Bader was being used, or sorry, excuse me, Sir Bader was being used in, right? Man, they might have just destroyed that plane. Came to the conclusion that Douglas made up the mid-air collision story because he didn't want to have to admit that he was shot down and bested by a German pilot. Oh my god. That just makes me, it just makes me upset. It's like, <laughs> what? Especially when, like, like everything you do is just getting a micro managed and scrutinized, right? Like, even if you give your official report, they can just throw it out. It seems it's like, oh, no, you clearly just, this is what happened. Cool, glad to know that you <laughs> you were there at that time. And the reasoning for that is that the German documentation captured after the war didn't oh show God. that there was any mid-air collision around this time period. Ah, uh, yes, because that's a citable source with absolutely no bias or cover-ups. Oh, my God. Like, what is this logic? Here's a caveat to that. The documentation also didn't show that they shot down Douglas either. So now the leading theory is that he was actually a victim of friendly fire somehow. <laughs> Which, you know what? To be fair, as much as I want to have Bada's back on this one, if you take a step back and really look at it, it does make perfect sense because... What person in their right mind would take the word of their own guy who was fucking there and lived yeah. through it over the word of the German military in the 1940s? I mean, yeah, the audacity. The, how could they? <laughs> I can't keep a straight face. The Germans back then were just batting 100. They never fucking <laughs> lied about anything ever. They definitely didn't build an entire military in secrecy, violating nope. the Treaty of Versailles so they could try to take over the fucking planet. And they definitely didn't have a crazy military dictator dosed up on amphetamines and testosterone <laughs> who people were literally scared to give him bad news. There's no way that they would lie on this documentation. All right, so Absolutely no fabrication whatsoever. Absolutely 100% truthful, no cap. <laughs> Back 
to Douglas, he's hanging out at this POW camp with one prosthetic leg. Word finally gets spread around throughout Britain and throughout the German ranks that they finally caught the famous legless fighter ace that the British had. And upon hearing that, one of Germany's most famous fighter pilot aces, Adolf Galland, who had apparently been running missions against Bada for a while now, wanted to go meet him in person. And for whatever reason, he's actually nice to Bada, so nice that he actually writes the British government and is like, hey, we got your guy, he's missing one of his legs, would you guys mind airdropping another prosthetic for him so he could walk around? To which Brit That's actually like two warriors meeting each other and just having that mutual respect, it almost feels like. And I, I love it. Britain is like, absolutely, sure, why not? Great Britain launches Operation Leg, where they are given free passage through German airspace to airdrop an extra prosthetic leg for Bada. And then after dropping the leg, they kept going and bombed the local power plant. Okay, look, if you're not cheating, you're not trying. You don't like it, don't try to take over the entire world. I don't know what else to tell you. Pretty so now sure that Bada's got crime. both his legs, he decides it is going to be his personal mission to be the biggest pain in the ass humanly possible. Yeah. He is going to constantly try to escape the POW camp, and he is going to fuck with the guards every chance he gets, or as he calls it, goon baiting. One of his first attempts at escape, he's on like the third story of a hospital, so he takes all the bed sheets he can find, ties them together in a rope, just like you see in the movies, ties it to the radiator in the room, throws <laughs> the rope out the window, but the rope isn't long enough. And he's looking around, he's like, shit, what else can I use? There's a guy in a coma that he's sharing the room with. So oh, no. he ties the rope to that guy's bed frame and pushes the guy in the coma bed over to the window to get it close enough to the ground. He repels down to the ground and runs off, but the Germans catch him again. Yeah. Then after he gets out of the hospital, he goes to a normal POW camp where he tries to Andy Dufresne his way out. He tries to dig a tunnel out of the POW camp using his prosthetic leg as a shovel Amazing. and taking all the excess dirt that he has putting it inside of his prosthetic leg and walking away with it before falling down to dump out all the excess <laughs> dirt so they never see any big dirt piles. But if it, Oh my God, that's brilliant. I love this man. Actually, that plan gets busted too. And then in August of 1942, after a year in captivity, he finally makes it out of the POW camp. He escapes and he's gone for like 36 hours. They put out a nationwide manhunt. Wow. They're getting posters ready. They are absolutely going to find this guy. They were getting their ass kicked by him in aerial combat. There is no way that that these guys are going to admit that a man with no legs was able to escape their POW camp. And then <laughs> like, <laughs> Oh my god. I love this man. This this man is like it There are internet trolls that could take cues from this man. That that could take his <laughs> His logos, his logic behind it. Oh my god, this is this is this is perfect. I love it. Eventually they do end up tracking him down, take him back into custody, at which point they decide they're gonna send him to Kolditz Castle, which is believed to be an inescapable prison, which is apparently where he has to go because they are absolutely not gonna let the guy with no legs get away. And that is where he would remain <laughs> until 1945 when the U.S. Army liberated him and returned him home. From yeah. there, he would receive a hero's welcome, retire from the RAF, and then a movie would be made about his life called Reach for the Sky. It is considered to be a classic piece of British film, and it made him one of the most famous men on the planet at this point in time. He then decided that he was going to use all of his newfound fame to put out the message that it was still possible to accomplish things after a horrific injury and becoming disabled. And he I wonder, because Tolkien was alive at this time, Sir Christopher Lee was definitely alive. I wonder if they ever met. I have no way, I don't even know where to begin researching that. That'd be interesting, though. Because, like, they're really big deals. I... <laughs> Hi, Kip. Yes, you, you, Britain is mentioned, and suddenly you're on <laughs> Tolkien and Sir Christopher. No, well, just you, right. Like Tolkien served World War One. Sir Christopher Lee, big, big name, served in World War Two. I'm very curious. He was pretty busy during the war. Yes, well, talk about after the war.
I'm very curious. one of, if not the biggest advocate for disabled people on the planet. For this service to the world, he would end up getting knighted by the queen and officially become Sir Douglas Botta. He would then continue to travel and give talks and advocate for the rest of his life until passing away at the age of 72 on September 5th, 1982. But one of those talks that he gave is actually my favorite part of this entire story because it really captures how much of an anti-hero Douglas Botta really was. He was giving a speech at an all-girls school telling his incredible story about being a pilot during a World War II. Two. And at some point during that story, he says, and I quote, so there were two of the fuckers behind me, three of the fuckers to my right, and another fucker on the left. At this point, the audience is like, yes. And the headmistress <laughs> of the school has all the color drained from her face and she goes ghost white. And she's like, ladies, ladies, a fucking is a German aircraft. At which point. <laughs> oh. I gotta use that excuse now. Sir Douglas Bader replies, and I quote, that may be madame, but these fuckers were Messerschmitts. Thank you for watching. Best way to support the channel is go check out thefatelectrician.com, get some merch, subscribe to Patreon. Thanks for watching. Quack bang, out. God, that's perfect. That the is... lengths haters will go to just to hate will never, ever cease to amaze me. It, it really won't. And it's a damn shame. God. That man gave no German aircrafts. <laughs> I'm gonna start using that excuse now. Oh my god. Look at this idiot! <laughs> Look at this! <laughs> when the algorithm recommends my own shit now. <laughs> I thought this was amazing. Thank you, Pat Electrician, for this. This was awesome. Absolute badass. Absolute legend. Oh my god. This was amazing. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Have you heard about the legacy of Sir Douglas Bader before? Have you not? I sorry, bought, excuse me. What are your thoughts on this? What are your thoughts on a uh, military command structure and <laughs> definitely being apparently reliable? I'm definitely going to be on a Department of Defense watch list. <laughs> Let me know in the comments section. And as always, Definitely go check out the Fat Elixir if you have an awesome content creator, awesome individual. Love following his stuff, and you absolutely should go support him. And yeah, I'll catch you in the next one.